Welcome to UCLA Radiology. This is Susie Muir from UCLA Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. Podcast number four is a case study in right hip pain to be presented by Dr. Cameron Azadi from Cedar sinai Medical Center. Hello and welcome to our case study for today. So let's start with our patient. He's a 31-year-old afebrile man with right hip pain for several years duration. First study that was ordered in the emergency department was a plain film of the right hip. This is what his plain film looked like. Go ahead and take a few moments. Try to point out the pertinent findings. So what are the findings? Is there marked diffuse joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, subchondral cyst formation, a soft tissue mass, or possibly a fracture? There may be any combination of these findings present on the film. So the answer is diffuse joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, and subchondral cyst formation. Let's go back now and take a look at the image. So in the right hip we have diffuse joint space narrowing. No part of the joint space is spared in this process. There is marked sclerosis both along the acetabulum and femoral head. And if you look very closely, and I know it's difficult, you can see tiny cystic areas along the femoral head and acetabulum consistent with subchondral cyst formation. And looking at this film, there's no definite evidence for a fracture or soft tissue mass. So given his history and his findings on the plain film, an MRI of the right hip was ordered. And let's go ahead and take a look at a few of the images from his scan. Here's a coronal T1 weighted image. Obviously the findings are on the right side. Go ahead and take a few moments and try to characterize these findings. Here's an axial T1 weighted image through the right hip. Again, try and characterize these findings. Now we have another axial cut through the right hip, but with a T2 weighted sequence and fat saturation was done. Finally, we have a sagittal T2 weighted image through the right hip with fat saturation. So the findings are erosive changes along the right hip joint involving the femoral head and also the acetabulum. And the key finding is within the joint space itself there is a mass characterized by intermediate signal on T1 weighted images and rather dark signal on the T2 weighted images. And the mass extends posteriorly between the femoral neck and ischial tuberosity. So let's go back and take a look at these uh, images. Here's our coronal T1. Again, note the diffuse joint space narrowing within the right hip, and there's involvement within the bones of a mass involving the joint space. We don't have nice clear uh, osseous surfaces like we do on the left side, which is normal. And this mass is of intermediate signal on the T1 weighted image. Here we have our axial a cut, same sequence, again, intermediate to low signal mass, there's involvement of the bone, this mass does extend posteriorly. Here we have our T2 weighted image, we have a nice example here of a subchondral cyst, it's well demarcated, there's a demodus change within the femoral head, a significant amount of erosive changes have occurred along the articular surface of the femoral head and acetabulum. You don't see any intact surfaces here. And our mass does extend, again, quite posteriorly. This is uh, uh, areas of low signal and high signal within the mass, consistent with edema. And then there's also edema around this mass. Similar findings, again, now just a sagittal cut, this sh again, showing the posterior aspect of the mass, mixed signal within it, and edema around its periphery.
So given uh, the findings and his clinical history, what do you uh, suspect that this patient has? Do you think he has a septic hip joint, possibly synovial sarcoma, possibly pigmented villonodular synovitis, maybe RA, maybe gout, perhaps amyloid arthropathy? So our patient ended up having pigmented villonodular synovitis. So let's take a few moments to discuss pigmented villonodular synovitis, or PVNS. It is a benign proliferative disorder of uncertain etiology that affects the synovial lined joints, bursa, and tendon sheaths. The disorder results in a various degree of villus and or nodular changes in the affected structures, hence its name. Two primary forms have been described, including a diffuse form that affects the entire synovial lining of a joint, bursa, or tendon sheath, and a rare focal or localized form. The diffuse form typically involves the large joints, while the localized form typically occurs around the small joints of the hands and feet. So in our patient, he had the more typical diffuse form involving the large right hip joint. In terms of pathology, gross pathological features include a thickened synovium with a combination of villus and nodular proliferation depending on the site of involvement. Microscopy shows hemosiderin-laden multinucleated giant cells. That's what gives it its typical low signal on T1 and T2 weighted MRI images. And then PVNS typically invades the local tissues with invasion of subchondral bone and result in cyst formation. And we had a nice example of that within the femoral head of our patient. So key imaging findings. There may be a large joint effusion, although our patient did not uh, demonstrate that. Uh, bone density may be normal. Cartilage is often preserved until late in the process. Erosions can be seen in up to 50% of the cases. Large, well-marginated subchondral cysts may be present. Then there may be secondary osteoarthritic changes if the disease uh, occurs late in the process. And uh, that includes cartilage narrowing and osteophyte formation. And very rarely and late in the process, there may be dystrophic calcification. So our patient definitely presented quite late as his symptoms were chronic and he had a significant amount of secondary arthritic changes. So in terms of the uh, synovial base masses, they may uh, be solitary and nodular. They may diffusely thicken the synovium. Uh, T1 uh, typically is going to be a low signal and homogenous. On T2 weighted MRI, it's oftentimes a low signal but can be inhomogeneous depending on whether there is edema or hemorrhage. On gradient echo uh, sequences, uh, you will have a blooming artifact related to the presence of hemosiderin. And again, those uh, the hemosiderin um, is within the multinucleated giant cells. And there is a variable enhancement on post-contrast imaging. So what are the treatment options? You can uh, resect the mass with the synovectomy. And you want to try to do, uh, remove uh, the entire uh, synovium. Because if you do not, there is a high recurrence rate of uh, PVNS. So if you use uh, arthroscopic measures, you may uh, not have complete access. And in, in those cases, you can go to an open procedure. If recurrence does occur after a synovectomy, radiation therapy is an option. And in cases which are refractory, or in cases in which there are, uh, is severe secondary osteoarthritic change, an arthroplasty or arthrodesis may be performed. And so here is our patient uh, several months later. Uh, due to the amount of osteoarthritic change that occurred within his right hip, he just went on and had a total right hip arthroplasty. So in summary, uh, PVNS is a monoarticular proliferation of hemorrhagic synovium. It occurs in the joint, bursa, or tendon sheath. There are two forms, a diffuse form that typically involves the large joints and a focal or localized form, which involves the small joints typically in the hands and feet. On a plain film, uh, you may see a large joint effusion with associated erosions and subchondral cysts. If the process is occurring quite late, uh, you may have a significant amount of secondary osteoarthritis, in which uh, in, in 
what we saw in, with our patient uh, in terms of um, the MRI. Again, you may see uh, an effusion with synovial pro proliferation and a low signal on all sequences and blooming on gradient echo, and that, again, is due to the presence of hemosiderin. Treatment is with synovectomy, radiation in terms of recurrence, and uh, if cases are refractory or there are secondary, a significant secondary arthritic change, a patient can go straight to arthroplasty. Thank you for your time. Please visit our resident-run Wikispace site at http colon forward slash forward slash pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com for interesting case studies in all specialties of pediatric imaging.